Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by Native, a clean deodorant that smells great and simply works. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code BRAIN during checkout. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, we are here again doing another show in the midst of what's now known as a pandemic. If you are listening to this in the future, today is, what is it, 312 2020. So March 12th, 2020, we are in the middle of the COVID COVID-19 virus pandemic. And um, people are scared. Some people, some people are panicky. Some people are uh, not bothered at all. Some people are going about their lives and some people are quarantined. And some people, of course, are dying. And uh, the rest of us are trying to figure out what do we do? What should we do? And I'm not here to talk about that necessarily today. I think there's a lot of that information out there. And anything that I tell you might just be my interpretation anyway of what should be done or what you should do. But I am in the business of emotional health and mental well-being. So I just want to maybe tell you that, you know, as we're going through this, one thing to remember is that people can make the best prediction about what's going to happen. But I don't necessarily go by prediction. I like to go by history and patterns. And I do this the same thing with relationships. I go by patterns. When you're in a relationship and the pattern has been, uh, he or she yells at me every time I come home from work, that's going to be the pattern tomorrow. And so I look at the virus, I look at the pandemic, and I ask myself, okay, what has happened? And I see Italy is closed. I see different countries having outbreaks. And I'm seeing the infected double on some days in some countries. And I'm seeing here in the U.S., it, um, it is happening all around me. In fact, uh, a guy just died, a 67-year-old man just died in Marietta, right down the road from where we live. So it's here. It is here. And what do you do about it? So I like to be in a prepared mode and a critical thinking mode. And that involves looking at what has happened and what should I do about what has happened for the future. I don't look at what I believe will happen. I look at what has happened. And that sounds a little strange. I think I uh, sent a newsletter out recently about this as well. But uh, when you think about what has happened, if you knew that was going to happen, what would you do? That's how I look at things. I'm not saying that's the right thing. I'm not saying that you should follow my logic here. I'm not saying that you should do what I would do. I'm saying that when you think about what you should do, instead of acting from a fight or flight response, some people might call that fear or panic. Instead of acting from that place, you look at the past and you ask yourself, okay, knowing that has happened and that will probably happen here, what should I do to prepare? And, you know, maybe that's buying lots of toilet paper. I don't know, but that's what's happening. You hear it all over the place. People scarfing up the toilet paper, but if they think they're going to be quarantined, they want more toilet paper. And okay, we can see there might be some logic in that argument, Uh, but what should you do? And this is where I look at our mental health and, of course, our physical health, too. But our mental health is going to drive our behavior. And what 
would be the most mentally healthy thing to do, and that is to prepare based on what we know that has already happened. And what this does is prevent us from following predictions that could be anything. It eliminates us from going down a path and preparing for something that we can't prove or disprove. But when we look at the past and see the patterns of what's happening now, we can put ourselves in that past and say, okay, if this was happening to me in this area, to my family, to my friends, what would I do? And yes, it is sort of looking at it in a way where you're predicting what will happen. But I think the best way to do that is to see what has already happened because you can prove what has already happened. You can just look it up. You can call your friend in Italy and find out if Italy is really closed. You can do all the research you need to do and prove that this stuff has already happened. So with proven data, you can make the right decision. And I don't know what that right decision is for you because we're all in the same boat. You know, I do listen to the CDC. I do listen to scientists. I do listen to and watch what I believe to be credible sources. And I pay no attention to the hype. I don't listen to people to say everything is going to be great. And I don't listen to people that say everything is going to be devastating. I don't listen to anyone that tells me anything that really can't be proven because only the past can be proven. You know, I'm saying this with the understanding that yes, science can prove and we can determine through science what will happen and such. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what can you latch onto as solid proof for you? Because even when science comes along and says, this is true, people still come out of the woodwork and say, I don't believe it. There's a conspiracy. And I want you to be careful what you latch onto. Don't latch onto the sensationalism. And I don't think people listening to this show really latch onto sensationalism. I don't think they latch onto hype. I don't think you're like that, but because the pandemic is here and we're going through it, then we need to be realistic. We need to look at the past, in my opinion, and figure out what steps we need to take based on the past. As if we were in the past, in that location of the world, and it was happening to us, what would we do then? How would we have prepared better then? And just take those lessons into today. Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We can all predict that it will spread. Absolutely. We can predict that. And some people won't. Some people say it's going to die off. Some people in the highest government positions are saying it's going to die off. And who knows? They could be right. They could be wrong. But I have to seek truth inside of me. And I believe a good part of seeking that truth is looking at the patterns, looking at the past, understanding what has happened, giving me the knowledge I need to take steps that I need to take because what has happened will likely happen. Instead of saying what has happened doesn't necessarily mean it'll happen here uh, or it may be a lot worse here or it might be nothing here. It may have just a, a minimal effect on us here. No matter what, I'm going to prepare for the future by looking into the past. And this is common sense. I know it is. I know I'm speaking common sense here. But at the same time, sometimes we need to hear a bit of common sense when there's so much craziness that can be sensationalized. And I'm not blaming media either. A lot of people blame media, but really we are responsible for how we take the information and what we do with it. So that might be controversial. I get it. And I'm not here to be controversial or political on this particular matter, but when you hear something that sounds sensational or just bad news all the time from the media, you have to just look at the facts because the media has always done that. At least a lot of the media. A lot of the media has really pushed us to the line by engaging our emotional state. They want us to be engaged. They want us to be psychologically attached to what they're talking about. So they present things in a certain way. Again, most media does this. Not all of it. How do you write an engaging headline? How do you engage with an audience? Well, you show up at a hurricane and in the middle of the hurricane, you host your segment and the wind's blowing and the rain's blowing. And it's interesting because it's sensational. It's something that we're not always exposed to. It's information that is novel to our brain and novel information usually engages more. 
So that's why the media does this. It, it, some people might call it fear mongering, but I just call it information that I have to filter. And I think that's with anything you hear, you always have to filter the information so that you're just getting the data and not the emotional state that the person or entity is trying to convey. Now, there might be sad stories, of course, and that will engage your emotions. But when you're getting information from all these different sources, just look at the facts. Do your best to filter out the emotional stuff, the psychological engagement that they want to create, and find worthy sources to get your information from. And again, my point on this segment isn't necessarily about who to listen to, who to believe, what to do. It's about listening to yourself. It's about going inward and realizing you have the ability to make the right decision based on the data that you have received so far. And your right decision might look like someone else's panic. And their panic might look like someone else's peace. And it's really hard to go by how other people are reacting. So you have to start to trust your inner guidance, if I can even call it that. It's your subconscious mind. It's your deeper wisdom. You may not have gone through this before, but because of what has happened in the world, you can make a logical decision. And it may not be a good decision. It may be the wrong one. You don't know. I don't know. I might be doing the wrong thing. I might be taking the wrong steps. But you do the best you can. And you have to trust what's going on. And if you believe the best you can is to stock some more toilet paper, stock some more uh, antibacterial wipes and soaps. And if you believe that's what it is for you, because if that brings you comfort and safety, then that's probably what you need to do. Now, it would be irresponsible of me to not say that perhaps you shouldn't go overboard. Perhaps you shouldn't take every single last one on the shelf because there's other people in the world and they need help too. And hopefully we can all get through this. And by the time we're out of it, We can all look back and say, hey, you know what? I helped my neighbor at that moment. I helped my friend. I helped my family. I did what I could. I wasn't one of those people. (laughs) And I don't want to define what one of those people are. You know what I mean, and you know who you are. (laughs) Those people want it all for themselves and want to protect themselves and don't necessarily care about anyone else in their life because it's all about them. I don't think people like that listen to this show, but you know... There might be someone who accidentally tuned in looking for something else and then they got this. (laughs) I know this is a tough time. Keep your mental strength up. Keep your emotional well-being up. If you can't do it for yourself, then you can pull it out for others because some people in your life may need your strength, may need your courage and your resilience. And the way you handle things can go a long way in other people's minds. And uh, if you're not freaking out, Maybe they won't either. But again, look at the past and prepare for what you've seen, for what you know has happened. And look at the facts and make the best decision you can. I mean, that's all anyone can ask of you. I didn't plan on talking about this today, but um, I am going to bring up something else when we come back. And it's about um, someone whose life is going nowhere and they feel trapped and they want advice. And I'll do my best. Sometimes that can be difficult especially during times when everyone is having a challenge. Uh, So what do you do? You feel even more left out, more alone when you're going through something like that uh, because everyone else is so focused and preoccupied with other things. We'll be right back. I'll talk about that in a moment. So talk about taking care of yourself and your loved ones. Um, this is the perfect time to talk about native deodorant. Now, how am I going to tie this in? <laughs> well, native wants you to take care of your body because you're the only place you have to live. Native is one of those clean deodorants. It's safe. It's formulated without aluminum, parabens, or talc. It's also vegan and never tested on animals. Why is all that important? Because We're being told because of the uh, coronavirus that we need to take care of ourselves. We need to make sure that we stay healthy 
because those who aren't as healthy could be more susceptible to the virus. And what do you do? You, you stay in shape, you eat right, and what do you put in your body? And, you know, everything counts. Everything counts. That's why I love native deodorant. They have ingredients that you know. I mean, they're made with ingredients that you've heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. And because you wear deodorant every day, at least most people do, you should be able to understand the ingredient list. And quite frankly, it works. I, I remember my girlfriend a few weeks ago. This is the first time I've ever seen this. She was upset that we didn't have any native in the house. And uh, she said, you have to order more native. And this is a true story. She, she told me, have you ordered it yet? And she kept getting on my back, getting on my back. Have you ordered it yet? Have you ordered it yet? And I finally said, honey, I, I ordered it. I finally ordered it. And I also got you the mini native deodorants, the portable ones that you can take with you. And they, they look like little, I don't even know, like half eggs or something. And uh, they come in all these different scents like um, coconut and vanilla, which is her favorite, lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, eucalyptus and mint. I think we got four of them. And each one is a different scent. So she gets to try them all. And um, she won't use anything else. She will only use native deodorant. She loves it. So they have something for everyone. It comes in a wide variety of options for men, women, and even teens. They also have an unscented option, like the baking soda free formula for those with sensitivities. There's no risk to try, free shipping on every order, and Native offers 30-day free returns and exchanges in the USA. I want you to check out Native. Go to nativedeodorant.com, and when you check out, use the promo code BRAIN during checkout. You'll get 20% off your first purchase. That's nativedeodorant.com using the promo code BRAIN during checkout to get that 20% off your first purchase. Don't even listen to me. Listen to my girlfriend or listen to the 9,000 five-star reviews from happy customers who made the switch to Native. nativedeodorant.com. Use the promo code BRAIN. Get your 20% discount today. Welcome back. I'm going to read you a short email that I got uh, just recently. Uh, this person, I'm going to call him Joe. Joe says, I listen to your podcast and they help me on a daily basis. I've been dealing with a dead end job and heavy anxiety and I keep falling back into the same loop where I feel like my life is going nowhere and I'm failing myself and my loved ones and it leads me to using drugs to help me deal with things. I feel lost and trapped in this vicious circle. Any advice you could give me uh, would be much appreciated. Okay, Joe, thank you for that email. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there are some details that I probably could use to help you uh, determine or at least help me determine what I could you know, offer you for advice. But one of the first things that sticks out, there's always something that sticks out to me, is uh, something you said about being in a dead-end job. My first question, do you even like your job? You know, I know it's a dead end job and that means different things to different people, but do you like your job? I'm going to guess no. You know, that's one of the details I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to assume you don't like it. Somebody in a, a job they love is probably not going to call it a dead end job, but they might, they might, they might say, well, you know, I work at this thing and I do it every day and it's not going to take me anywhere, but I love doing it. And so there, there can be that out in the world, jobs that you might call a dead end job meaning who knows that could mean that you can't go anywhere with it. You can't, um, get a raise. You can't get promotions. You can't get, uh, moved into different departments or positions. Who knows? I mean, maybe you mean that, or maybe you just mean, I hate this job and I can't wait to leave it because it sucks. <laughs> and if that's the case, my question to you is, is there anything you like about it? You know, I, I asked the question, do you like your job? I'm going to assume no. Is there anything you like about it? If there's something you like about it, what is it? You know, and why? Why do you like that? And the reason I'm asking that is because sometimes we're in a crummy place in life, but we really like that person. You know, you might like a person that you work with, or you really like this part of the job. You do something at your job that you enjoy, or that's not so bad, and the time passes fast, or whatever. So think about that. Do you like anything about your job? 
Do you like the the drive to your job? Is it short? Is it long? You know, maybe you don't. Uh, I'm asking so you'll recognize any positive characteristics about it. Now, next question is, what do you hate about your job? And here I want you to be really specific because there are probably particular things about the job that you either don't like or really hate and you don't like doing them on a daily basis. So you feel like job is worse than you want it to be. And okay, so you come up with answers for that. What do I like about it? What do I hate about it? Um, If the job had you doing something different, like if you worked in a different department if you were a supervisor or if you were a subordinate to someone else or whatever it is for you, would that make the job different? Would it make it better? Or is the job itself just something you don't like to do? If you're tarring roofs in Florida in the hot sun with black tar or black top, whatever they call it, maybe you just can't stand it. You can't stand being in the heat. You can't stand um, all the hot tar and you just want to get away from that. It could be just the job itself. So I'm just helping you identify components that you don't like and that you do like. The reason I'm saying that is because sometimes we're stuck in a dead-end job that there's something about it that we really don't like, and we don't say anything. And when you don't say anything, you don't change anything. I've been in dead-end jobs. I've been in jobs that... I really knew I wasn't going anywhere and I didn't like the job. I didn't like some of the people and on and on. There are things that I liked and things that I didn't like, but I really didn't like it because I never spoke up about what I didn't like. And I think some of us go through life not honoring what we're thinking and feeling inside and we don't choose to stand up for ourselves and say something. Because we're afraid. We're afraid of what might happen. We might get fired. We might not have a paycheck next week. Uh, People might be disappointed in us. And so we have all these fears that are externally based that have nothing to do with how we feel inside. All these fears, I mean, they're related, of course. You know, my fear of getting fired has something to do with the fact that I hate this part of my job. That's related. But what's really happening inside of you and people that go through this is that we don't want to stand up and honor ourselves and say what we really want. A lot of people have a hard time doing that. This is what I would like. That's a good way to ask for what you want. This is what I would like. I find this part of my job grueling and it makes me unhappy. And I would like to keep this job, but I don't want to do this part of the job anymore. Your boss might say, well, that's too bad because that's the job. And if you don't like it, you're going to have to leave. And that might be what happens. But let me tell you what happens inside of you when you ask for what you want. You end up lining up with your integrity, your dignity. You build your character. You strengthen your self-worth. You strengthen your self-esteem. You get into complete synchronicity with who you're supposed to be. And that's tough. (laughs) I mean, it's great, but it's tough. Because what you're doing is you're going against the grain. You're going against the system. The system is keep your eyes on your screen and keep your suggestions to yourself. I've been told this. I've been told this at a job that I felt was a dead end job. And I decided to stand up and ask my supervisor, hey, can we do this instead? Because it would help our job. It would help our morale, it would help our customer service. Can we do this instead? Can I offer this suggestion? Can I do it for us? Can I create this system so we have something in place that helps the staff, that helps the team? And I was told, you're better off keeping your eyes on your screen and your suggestions to yourself. You realize that completely crushed me. It crushed me. Hey, Paul, you said you're supposed to stand up for yourself and ask for what you want. I did. But when I heard that feedback, it was devastating because I felt stuck. And this is what happens when you stand up for yourself. You're going to get denied. Not always. I mean, most of the time, hopefully not. But it's going to happen. When you stand up for yourself, you're going to get rejected. You're going to get denied. You're going to be told, 
why that's not feasible and what you should do instead and how you land and get back on track will be what either strengthens or weakens you from that point on. And I really had to sit with those words. You just keep your eyes on your screen and your suggestions to yourself. I had to sit with those words at my desk and contemplate what I had to do next. And this was a time when I needed money. I was married. We were homeless. We were living in her mom's tiny little apartment and we had no money, literally. And this was the only source of income. And I had just started three weeks ago. So I didn't even think I got my first paycheck yet. And here I am sitting in this desk in this giant office, bunch of cubicles. Uh, Not that that's a problem, but I just felt like a number. I just felt like I didn't matter. And for the first time in maybe my life, I looked at my circumstances and decided to honor myself over my circumstances. And it sounds a little weird and I'm probably not saying it right, but I looked at who I was inside and who I wanted to be and how I wanted to show up in the world and decided that was more important than any outcome that could come out of this. That is tough. (laughs) That is so tough to follow because it's a risk. You take a huge risk when you stand up for yourself. But the risk in my life has always paid off. And it almost always does in everyone I've talked to when they choose to stand up for themselves and ask for what they want. And not that you ask for something outrageous like I want a massage chair at my desk, although that may not be outrageous. Maybe it's perfect if you've worked there for 10 years and you're getting a sore back. It could be a perfectly reasonable request. But you ask for something legitimate, something reasonable, and something that is in alignment with who you are and who you want to be. And all of this strengthens your character, your integrity, your dignity, your self-esteem, your self-worth, and you move into a new space in yourself when you're willing to take that risk. And I'm not saying that's my advice. I'm saying if you can get on board with that line of thinking, your life changes. It has to. It has no choice but to change because instead of just accepting what everybody wants for you, which isn't always in alignment with who you are, you stand up and ask for what you want. And if you can't get what you want, this is all part of the risk. You may have to walk. You may have to change the rules. You may have to say, well, you know, in Joe's case, if you can't accommodate what I want, then I can't work here. And Joe might think, oh my God, if I lose my paycheck, then what? Well, I look at the past, Joe, and anyone that can relate to this, I look at the past and I see times when I lost my job and I didn't have another one to go to, or I didn't have a home, or I was in a relationship that failed and she left and I was alone and depressed. I look at all these times I didn't succeed in life. And in fact, I look at the times that I was just completely devastated And knew in those moments that I wouldn't be able to get through it, but somehow I managed to, and somehow I'm here today. These are my references. This is what happens when you're nearing 50, is that you've experienced so much in life that you realize you're going to get through it. And the younger you are, the less references you typically have. The less references, uh, the more fear. And I get messages from very young people that say, oh no, he just broke up with me or she just broke up with me. I'm devastated. I don't know what to do. I'll never find anyone like that again and I'll never be happy again. I get those not as often as I could, but I get them. And when I get those messages, you know, it's hard because when I was young, a devastation like that seems absolutely defeating and absolutely no way to get through it. And when you're in that space, It's very difficult to be positive or optimistic about anything, but you get through it. You always do. You always get through it. There's always a path out of it. There's always a new direction or a new thought that comes to mind or a new strength that appears inside of you out of nowhere or a book that you read or a podcast that you listen to or a video that you watch or that perfect series of events that just seems to get you out of it. And some people, it can last six months, it can last a year, it can last five years. I know there are times where it just seems like the most dismal part of your life lasts so long, but then you get through it. 
And I also know there are people listening now that still aren't getting through it. There are things that they're not doing. And this is things that are happening to them or have happened to them that keeps them in the vicious cycle that you're talking about, Joe. It's like, oh, I have this dead end job. I feel like a failure and I'm, I got to do drugs so I can feel better or at least get through the pain, whatever it is for you. And I wanted to ask you those questions and talk about what we did in the segment to remind you that a lot of the reasons bad things happen in our life, you know, besides the fact that people just can be cruel sometimes and bad luck can happen, there are a lot of things that do happen that we, that are out of our control, but there's a lot of things that we do in life that are in our control, but we simply don't say anything to stop it. And if you are experiencing something awful and you can stand up and say, look, I won't take this anymore, even at the risk that you could be fired or yelled at or someone might leave you, but you align with your integrity, you align with who you want to be and how you want to be treated, suddenly your life changes because now you're going in the direction of what you want. And it really is all about boundaries. You know, you look at where your boundaries are being crossed and you decide what you're going to do about it. That doesn't mean you go beat people up. It just means you stand up for yourself. And that might mean you saying to someone, look, I won't be disrespected anymore. I deserve respect. I deserve to be treated fairly. And so if you want me to continue this relationship, this is what I expect. Or if you want me to continue this job, I expect to be treated that way. And yes, that's tough. That is the toughest thing in the world to do. When I started honoring my boundaries, I knew there was a huge risk. And what got me through it was accepting the risk. I chose to accept whatever suffering came my way. And every single time I honored my boundaries, suffering never came my way. The only suffering was the fear. What ended up happening is I ended up getting rid of the toxic elements in my life and moving into a better space inside my own body, inside my own mind. I felt good in myself because I felt good about myself because I honored myself. And when you can get into that space and be really clear about how you want to be treated and knowing that you deserve maybe better than someone else is treating you or some job treats you, when you align with that inside yourself and you act from that place, your life has to change. It has no choice. And so, Joe, I know that this may or may not apply to you. Maybe it has nothing to do with your job. Maybe you can get another job tomorrow. I don't know. But I want you to think about where in your life you are allowing your boundaries to be crossed And why aren't you taking certain risks that may involve loss? I know it, but it also involves a strengthening of who you are at the very core to help you get through this and out the other side, a new person. I mean, I know why it's difficult to do this because I went through it, but I want you to consider what boundaries you have that you're not honoring, what boundaries are being crossed and what you're going to do to start honoring those boundaries. And there's a lot involved there. I'm not saying this is an easy step. It it sometimes takes baby steps. It sometimes takes you speaking to someone else, telling them that you don't like something they say to you or a way they treat you. It might even be a smaller boundary. Like, I don't want to watch that movie tonight. And in the past, you might have said, okay, I'll watch anything you want. But really, you didn't want to watch it. I'm not saying you do this every time. You have to accommodate sometimes because some people want to watch other things. But if you've never really honored yourself, if you've never stood up for yourself, then you're not going to feel important inside yourself. You're not going to value yourself. This is what happens is that we feel undervalued by other people, but I can almost always attribute it to how we value ourselves. I'm not saying always, I'm not saying that there aren't people out there that just can't value us the way we deserve it, but almost always I see this. If you undervalue yourself, you will be undervalued by others. As soon as I started valuing myself, I felt so good inside of me because I was respecting me, I was honoring me, and I held that with me everywhere I went, and I just expected it from other people. And when it didn't happen, 
I was in a place to be able to honor myself and either take myself away from that situation or speak up and say, you know what, this needs to change. And when you can be in that space, I'll say it one more time, your life changes. So I hope this helps you, Joe. I know there's other things about your email that I can talk about, but I want to leave you with that because I think that's probably the most important thing. Because if, as soon as you start valuing yourself, you're probably not going to want to put drugs in your system. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do drugs. I'm saying that if you find that's a problem and it's not in alignment with who you want to be, then you might start changing your habits and you might start improving yourself in different ways. And your life will change. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I appreciate you. We'll be right back. I'm going to say some thank yous and goodbyes and my final words after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Native Deodorant. Go to nativedeodorant.com forward slash brain and get 20% off your first purchase. And I want to tell you, I just found this out. They are relaunching their toothpaste line. So if you're looking for that clean experience in a toothpaste, check that out too over at nativedeodorant.com. And I also want to thank Kathleen for joining and being a generous patron over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining the patron program and supporting the show. Your support goes straight back into the show and helps us continue doing what we're doing over here. So thank you to Kathleen and everyone that has joined the patron program to become a supporter. Again, you can go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com if you find value in the show and you want to give back. Thank you to all patron members. I appreciate you. I also want to thank iTunes reviewers, uh, Weldichell and Tofu Kitten. <laughs> I read your comments and I appreciate your words. I don't think I said the first one right. Uh, thank you so much. And yes, Tofu Kitten, you don't have to adapt to toxic environments. That's what she said in her review. So I'm assuming she's a girl. She may not be, but I'm just going to think that's true and go with it. She says uh, she really loved the episode that I put out about it's not running away. It's a reset. That was just like last week or the week before. And that you don't have to adapt to toxic environments. No, you do not. In fact, I might just talk about that uh, during the outro in a moment. But um, thank you again, both of you. I appreciate any reviews out there that our people are leaving. I am trying to read them all as they come in. And I'm grateful for your time in filling that out. And I want to remind you of the safe empowerment system for social and generalized anxiety over at quietbegins.com. You know, I read that message from Joe and he is dealing with anxiety. And Joe, I don't know if you realize I have what I call sort of an audio masterclass in uh, anxiety. And I think that would be very helpful for you. So check it out over at quietbegins.com. And I want to remind you of my other podcast, Love and Abuse. It is a great podcast, in my opinion, for uh, anyone in a difficult relationship that wants to figure out how to get past or out of toxic communication and poisonous behavior over at loveandabuse.com. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. Like I said, maybe we can talk about adapting to a toxic environment. You know, I started today's episode talking about coronavirus. I mean, we hear about it all the time and you probably didn't want to hear it on this show, but it's out there and we have to talk about it every now and then. But uh, how do we adapt to that? How do we adopt to that toxic environment? Well, um, there's a difference between everyone dealing with the same thing and you by yourself dealing with it. And I think that's what um, the difference is, is that it's hard to adapt to a global pandemic when we're all going through it because we're all in the same boat. It, it's really hard to get out of that boat and hope that we aren't affected because we are in some way, shape or form. We're all affected by this somehow. So maybe it's not a matter of adapting to something like that, but just doing the next best thing that you can. Just like I was saying in the first segment, just do the best you can and, you know, collect the data, get the facts and do the best you can. That's not the same about toxic environments. When you're in a toxic environment like a terrible job, a terrible relationship, or at least uh, there's a lot of bad behavior 
and it's hard to get away from and it ruins your day every day or most days and you're unhappy more of the time than you're happy then this is the point where you actually have choices even though you may not think you have choices you might have a house you may have kids you may be married and it might be hard to leave because you have no money or you're in a job that you absolutely cannot leave and you must deal with the toxic elements of that job because you need a paycheck these are scenarios that appear in our lives that uh, we think we have no choice. We think we have no choice but to stick around and face the music and adapt. And my girlfriend and I were just talking about this yesterday. You know, sometimes you're presented with this no choice scenario when in reality you have a choice, you just don't like it. You just don't like the idea that you might have to do something that puts you in what you believe to be harm's way. My observation here and my own experience is when you're already in harm's way, then any change in scenery is a step in the right direction. Well, that yes, that can be argued. If I leave, then I'll be homeless. Yes, but let's go back to the first segment where what's the most important element of your life? Your life. You. You are the most important element in your life. If you don't fulfill and strengthen yourself in every way you possibly can, then you don't have much left to give to anyone else. And if you're going around always drained and out of energy and you're not happy and you're just barely scraping by, then you're not bringing the best version of yourself to the table. You're not bringing your happy self. You're bringing your drained and de-energized self and you become a slave to everyone else's needs. That's typically what happens is we think that we're being helpful to other people that need us, but uh, some of them drain us. Some of us feel like we're slowly dying emotionally, mentally, and physically. It's just a huge, huge drain on our system. And if you aren't taking care of yourself, you can't show up in a way that's helpful to anyone else. I mean, there are certain things you can do for other people that can help them along if you have kids or loved ones, but... Uh, if there are toxic people in your life that are draining you and you believe you have no choice but to stay around those toxic people or even toxic environments, then I implore you to explore the choices that you would definitely not consider. And the reason I say that is because sometimes we have a choice that we believe we don't because we never consider it. So the consideration of that choice just goes out of our mind. Well, I'm not going to consider that choice because it's just not an option. And we don't think about it. And if you don't think about something, you don't get any ideas about it. You don't get any thoughts that put you in a new direction because you've locked it out of your mind. And sometimes you just need to think outside the box and introduce choices that you absolutely don't want so that you start thinking in ways that you didn't. And who knows, maybe just by thinking of the choices that you don't want, it leads to one that you'd never considered before because you finally allowed yourself to consider that choice. Hard to explain unless you actually do it, but uh, it's worth doing. And uh, I think this is a great exercise to consider the unconsiderable or inconsiderable and stretch your mind into possibilities that might just give you the solution that you're looking for, or at least a step in the right direction. Because you never know what's down there until you start to explore what's down there. So take this with you. Stay safe, stay healthy, be smart, and keep an open mind so that you can step into your power. This will help you create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.